God is great. Our God is awesome. Celebrate. Celebrate. He's an Good morning. I greet all of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of you who are are with us today in worship here in the sanctuary and those of you joining us online on Sunday morning, on Friday afternoon, we are glad you are all here with us. We just saw a great video about our vacation Bible school that is going to be launching very, very soon. We're very, very excited about that. Uh, If you go out this door... Uh, to your right, immediately after the service, you'll see a table. We need people to bring food. We need people to volunteer to be crew leaders. We need people to help set up, take down. All the station uh, leaders are already uh, already have been selected, so I won't make a joke about you can't have my station because they're all full. But there are some great ways to serve, and we've got ways for everybody to serve in this church. Nobody, you say, well... I don't like kids. Well, that's okay. We've got things you can do that don't involve kids, but you support the Bible school. You say, I I, I love kids. It's in the evening, so it doesn't conflict with your work. Come on, sign up. It's going to be a great, great time. So let's move now into our time of worship. By the way, there are announcements in the bulletin. Please take a minute to read over those, and let's go to the Lord singing praises to our God. Saturday was silent, and surely it was through. Since when has impossible it ever stopped you? A Friday's disappointment, a Sunday's empty tomb. And since when has impossible it ever stopped you? This is the sound of the dry bones rattling This is the praise make a dead man walk again Open the grave, I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again This is the sound of the dry bones rattling Praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. God is able to 
to save and deliver and deal and restore anything that he wants to just ask the man who was thrown on the bones of elijah if there's anything that he can't do just ask the stone that was rolled at the tomb in the garden what happens when god says to move i feel him moving and now i feel him moving and now i am doing it now doing it now doing it now this is the sound of the dry bones rattling this is the praise make a dead man walk again open the grave i'm coming now i'm gonna live gonna live again open the grave i'm coming out i'm gonna live gonna live again open the grave i'm coming out i'm gonna live gonna live again this is the sound of the dry bones rattling Amen. Isn't it exciting to think about the, the miracles that God performed? Sometimes we don't always see them here on earth like we used to back in the Bible days, but he's still performing miracles in each of our lives if we allow it, and we're watching for that. So y'all continue to, to praise him with us through the next song and sing to him and tell him about how good he is to you. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures the fake are never enough. But then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than to show you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all and you still call me friend because the God of the mountain is still the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy and grace can't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Y'all sing that out to him. Oh, there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you you turn mourning to dancing you turn beauty to ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one. 
Seated, and I want to uh, recognize our graduating seniors. Oops, I hope I didn't unplug everything. Uh, this we have with us today, just very excited about all three of these individuals. And so, I'd like to invite uh, and the graduates and their parents uh, Matthew Sane and um, Andy McCain and Willow McLarty. Would y'all all come forward with your parents? Uh, come, come on up here and. <laughs> And uh, stand up front. Everybody can see you. We're just so excited about you guys. Um, just, just stand right here. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's great. Y'all come on up. Uh, Tony's going to bring each of you a gift here. We're uh, just very excited to give you a, a Bible and a commemorative photo of this occasion and a few other special things. Tony, I'll let you, uh, he, he, he organized it so he can make sure, Jennifer organized, but we want to make sure and give the right things to the right people. Okay, there you go. So we're very, very excited for you. Okay. We love you guys very, very much. And we want to make a, uh, commitment to you to pray for you. Right, we're going to get a photograph here. Let me let me stand right here so I don't look like I'm a giant. Okay. And then I would like to ask our three graduates you would kneel here at the communion rail, please. Yeah, find a place. And then I want to ask your parents to stand behind you and place your hands on your shoulders. There you go. Robin, why don't you come up here with your granddaughter, too? Wow. Uh, let's see. We got any other family here? Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want to pray for these wonderful people. Dear Lord, we thank you for these graduates here that we have for us today. We thank you for the families that they come from that have loved them, that have nurtured them, that have caught, cared for them and taught them so well to bring them to this day to day. And Lord Jesus, we just ask you pour out a special blessing here on each of them and their families, our whole households here at this time of graduation. Be with them and help them really enjoy and appreciate the accomplishment that has taken place here. And Lord, be with our graduates as they transition into new roles of life. Lord, we ask that you will help them to continue to seek you, even if their living situation changes, that they will continue to know you and walk with you, and you will open new doorways of your grace into their lives as they move into what we call a more adulthood type of living. Lord, minister your grace to them so they may receive the richest, most wonderful blessings and gifts that you have for each of them. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Congratulations, graduates. We love you.
Speaking of graduates, we are having a baccalaureate here at 5 o'clock, and if you would be so willing to come at 5 o'clock, uh, last year we did something really a lot of fun, uh, last two years, a congratulations line, and if you would just come and be at the service, and after the service, we're going to march our graduates out the door, hang a right, and go to the oak tree, and if you would be there to cheer them on as they go by you. That's all we ask you to do. It's going to be a really, really happy occasion. Also, if we could have a few more people, we've got a pretty good group of finger foods coming in, but if there were a few more might be willing to bring some finger foods, that would be greatly appreciated. We're looking forward to this time. So if you, the service is only 30 minutes, come here at 5 o'clock, 5.30. We need, you could help with the cheer line, and then you know, if you want to go on home or stay for the reception, it's going to be a really great thing. Each year, our... Uh, baccalaureate gets a little bit better every year and this year is no exception I'm very excited about that okay y'all I am glad to see y'all this morning I seriously need whoa so much help to do my message this morning who might want to help me all right come on up here storm who else might want to help me uh, Malik, come on Malik, come on up here all right I, who else might be willing to help me no? Okay, well, we'll make do with you two guys. Okay, could you be so kind as to hold my microphone? Hold it up high. I'm, I'm talking. It's got to be over here. Can you do this? Good. Uh, Storm, do you see that box of Kleenex over there? Would you go over there and get that? All right, I want you to pull a Kleenex out, please. Okay. Okay, and take a look at it. Has it been tampered with in any way whatsoever? He's, he's, he's thorough, yeah. No, don't take it apart, but is it, is it whole? Yeah, okay. So I'll take a Kleenex here, and it, it's whole, and you see it here, and we're gonna take it, and I'm gonna tear off a piece. I want you to hold that in one hand, squeeze it, hold it in the other hand, no, no, other hand. Here's a Kleenex. Hold it. Squeeze it. Squeeze it tight. Count to five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. What's in that hand? A piece of a Kleenex. Okay, which I tore off. And put, let's look at that one. There it goes. It's whole again. Thank you. You squeezed it really hard. You squeezed it back together. Amazing. All right, you can sit down. Thank you. This is a, you don't know how I did that? Oh, you know how I did it because y'all were standing so close. You could see the trick. For the people in TV land, we hope they couldn't see it. Uh, what you do is you tear the Kleenex ahead of time. Stick it under your watch or in your sleeve. And when you reach, pull it out, pretend to tear it. Now, some magicians even say, while they're looking at that, you stick it in your pocket. But I'm not that good, so that's why I had you hold both of them, and then it was made whole again. So I share this with you to make a point on this graduate honoring Sunday. Things are not always as they seem. And there's some things you just don't yet see, like your future. I graduated from high school in May of 1984, and if you would have told me back then, Dave, you're going to live in Chickasaw, Alabama, guess what I would have said? Where is that? But now this has been my home for nearly 10 years. So you don't see your future, but there is one who does, and that is our Lord. He already knows, and he's already there. Your role is to walk closely with our Lord so that when you get into the future, the God who already knows the future and has been there can guide you into his future. And that relates to y'all. Do y'all know what you're going to be doing a year from now? No. But walk with God. He already knows what you'll be doing a year from now, and he wants to help you. God bless you guys. And uh, y'all may go on to uh, children's worship, and I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. I need to get my prayer notes
One more time, let me remind you that next Sunday is a special Sunday. We will be entering into the next steps process. And if you could be so kind as to be here next Sunday, that would be greatly appreciated. Sunday school will be at 9 o'clock. One worship service. Dr. Bill Keir is preaching. He's an excellent preacher. You do not want to miss him. 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary. 11 o'clock is lunch. 12 o'clock, then we'll gather at tables and discuss our church. I believe you're going to leave here feeling very inspired and very excited about you being a part of what God is doing here in the United Me in Chickasaw United Methodist Church. There is some concern as the church, United Methodist Church nationwide, worldwide, goes forward. What's going to happen next? And I don't completely know, but I do know this. What we're doing with Next Steps and what happens with the Methodist Church worldwide are not connected to each other. I've had that question, and it's a good question, and I can tell you, Next Steps is about Chickasaw United Methodist Church. Us, we folks here at 108 Lee Street. So please be here. I really believe you're going to be really glad. I, you know, I hesitate to say that sentence. But I believe you're going to be really glad you took part in the experience. As we go to prayer today, we want to uh, pray for uh, Gary Johnson's family. His funeral will be here tomorrow. I uh, met with Gay Johnson and her family Friday. We had a wonderful time. So much love in that family. But let's pray for the Johnson family. Also, uh, Carol Evers is, continues to be in a hospice facility as cancer is working its work on her and let's be praying for Bill, Terry, Sherry, Jeffrey, and their whole family, and most of all, Carol, in these days ahead. Also, Melva Davis had surgery yesterday on her hip and on her wrist. She fell on Thursday, and she is doing the hard work, what hospitals call recovery. Uh, prayed with her last night. It's, 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 it's a lot on a person 93, 90, get that right, 93 years old. So let's pray for Melva. She's got a, a lot of work ahead, but I believe she's going to make it. And I've been thinking a lot about Isaiah 41.10 in this last week, where God says, I'm your God, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's God's promise for us that he will support us and care for us with his strong, not his left hand. I know some of us are left-handed, but that is his strongest hand, his righteous, holy hand. He's going to care for us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, and Noko Howell, I just found out yesterday, fell and broke her arm, and she was in the hospital. She has been... Um, released and is in a rehab facility. Shirley, do you know anything more? I, I just uh, got an email yesterday morning telling me about it, and I was quite surprised. And it'll be to Monday before I'll be able to go there to see her, but it was pray for NOCO. Dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being gathered here together. We thank you for your grace that is so persistent and so caring, and we thank you for how you do promise to care for us, to support us with your righteous right hand. And Lord Jesus, we do ask that you be with these people we've been talking about here, Noko and Melva and Carol and the Johnson family. Lord, support them and love them and minister your amazing grace to them. Help them with the challenges they're facing. And Lord, we do thank you for our three graduates that we just prayed for. What wonderful individuals they are. And we just ask that you will give them and their families special days in these days and weeks ahead. And help them with their transitions as they're making decisions that will impact them for the rest of their lives. Guide them. Help them receive and know your guidance in these days and weeks ahead. Our dear Lord, we, we, we give you this worship service and we... Thank you for the message that you put upon Tony's heart and mind and ask that he will bring us a powerful and a wonderful word about how your resources are limitless, but you always want to use our resources as part of you pouring out your resources into our lives. 
Help us understand this. Give us the gift of faith that we will say yes for these next steps you're calling us to take. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time, we'll worship God, giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, our King, we give you these gifts. We ask that you'll receive them. You will bless them. You will multiply them for kingdom work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me and join me as we welcome the Spirit with us? There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is up.
seated. Thank you, Brent and Angie, for your leadership and song. I love that one. Well, it's awesome that you're back. Uh, you know, last week, of course, uh, was Mother's Day, so we took a little pause to honor the godly women that have affected our lives in so many glorious ways. And, but now we're back into the sermon series that we call Elisha. If you were here the first week, we were, we were burning the plows. The second week, we were digging some ditches. And now this week, we're going to be grabbing some jars. And in two weeks, we're going to be grabbing the, our edge back as we look at an axe head that actually fell into a body of water. And by the power of God, he uses Elisha to get the edge back. And we're going to we're going to apply that metaphorically into our lives. But today, though, I hope this message ministers to everyone. But especially, I believe it will speak to those who feel overwhelmed. I f- it If you're feeling like there's too much going on, like you're in need right now, like you feel like you don't have enough energy or maybe enough time, some of you may feel even like you're really low on faith. I'm praying that this message would build your faith and minister to you in your time of need. In fact, just last week I had had two different conversations uh, that kind of shows this common type of pain. I was talking to a guy who was down on his luck. He was in financial uh, distress, and he just couldn't get, uh, get things going. He could never dig himself out. And then uh, I was talking to a single woman who had a full-time job and had, uh, was cleaning two houses on the side, and she was trying to take care of her three children, and she just said there's just too much going on, and she didn't know how she was going to make it. So if you find yourself today on empty and you feel like there's just too much in one area of your life, it's my prayer that God would use this story to minister to you in a deep and a life-changing way. So let's kind of dive into our text. We're going to be going to start with 2 Kings chapter 4, just to kind of set the context, and then we'll read some more and let God speak to us. So 2 Kings Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Here's how our story starts. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Now, let's talk about these two verses because there's actually a lot in them. The first thing that you notice is we don't know the poor widow's name. We don't know who she is. According to Jewish tradition, many believe that she was actually the wife of the prophet Obadiah. And if that was the case, then it would be no wonder that she was in financial need because Obadiah was known for protecting and providing for 50 other prophets. So indeed, if this was Obadiah's wife, she would have taken all of the re- he would have taken all the resources to meet the needs of the other prophets. And quite honestly... It would not be uncommon for a prophet's family to be financially struggling because struggling because they were always spending the majority of their life on the run, trying to survive, and it was very difficult to make ends meet. So if you can just picture this, we've got now a widow. We're going to guess somewhere in her early 30s, maybe her mid-30s, and she's lost her husband. She's got no chance at meaningful employment because in this culture, women were unable, were unemployable unless they were willing to take a job that no woman really wants to take. I'm just going to leave it at that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask me later. And so she's in really, really devastating place. She's lost her husband, and now the creditors are coming after her two sons because the law says that if you can't pay your debts, they can take your sons as slaves. And they will be slaves until they're released in the year of Jubilee. So it doesn't get any worse than this. 
humanly speaking, she has no hope whatsoever. She's lost her husband, she can't pay her bills, and now she's going to lose her sons. It doesn't really get any worse than this. And that is something that I always try to remember when I'm facing what I call life's smaller problems. You know, it's amazing, and my kids and my wife can attest to this, it's amazing how riled up I can get over the smallest of things. It's really not a big deal, and yet it happens over and over again. For example, you get really, really riled up when your GPS on your iPhone takes you to the wrong place again. You know, that's what we call an entry-level problem. If you're at the restaurant and you're just devastated because they put too much goat cheese on your salad. Oh, I didn't ask for that much goat cheese. And, you know, that's an entry-level problem. You're the same way. <laughs> You're really, really devastated when you only get seven likes on your most recent selfie on Instagram. And no one said, hashtag, you're so beautiful, I can't stand it. Those are entry-level problems. The reality is, many of us today, we don't have entry-level problems. You've got some graduate-level problems. Someone that you loved betrayed you and lied to you, and, and what you thought you had, you don't know what it is anymore. You've got a child or, or a grandchild that may be going the wrong way, and they're mature enough to know that if you keep going down that road, you're going to end up in the wrong place, and you're in agony because you're watching someone you love make a decision that's going to hurt them. Someone you may be, you, you or you may be in financial situation where you don't understand how you're going to get out of it. And there's such stress and you feel strangled in this kind of agony. Others of you, it may be a health issue. You went to the doctor or someone you did, you loved did, and, and there's, unless there's a miracle from God, you don't know what's going to happen. And you may end up experiencing the very thing that you wish never would happen. See, You've got graduate level problems. If you're in significant need today, I want to give you the key thought for the message that I believe God is going to drive into our spirits and build our faith. If you're taking notes, I want, you, I want you to write this down. And I hope that it blesses you as it blesses me. When you don't have what you really want, you will discover that God is what you really need. Let me say that again, because it's very important. When you don't have what you really want, you will discover that our good God is what you really need. So let's unpack this story and let this point come to life for us. So this woman is in significant need, and she expresses her need to the prophet. And what does the prophet do? Let me first tell you what he doesn't do. He doesn't say, oh man, that's a bad problem. That stinks to be you. He doesn't blow her off. He doesn't say, oh, that's bad. I'll be thinking about you. It's always funny that someone will say, I'll be thinking about you. Like, you know, I'm hurting and what you doing? Well, I'm thinking about you. No. Do something significant. If you want to think about me, pray while you're thinking, right? Do something significant. And that's exactly what he does. He makes himself available. To her and to see this in verse 2, Elisha replied to her, and what did he say? He said five words. He said, how can I help you? You want to make a difference in the world? You want to be filled with joy? You start every day and you say, God, I am available as your divine representative. Anytime there's a need, even if I can't directly meet the need, I want to be a conduit to minister to this person. And when someone at the office says, I've got a problem, I've got a migraine headache, my husband's driving me crazy, or my kids are going off the deep end, what you say is, how can I help you? And you make yourself available just like Christ would. And then he says to her something that is very profound. He respects her dignity and he's... And he says, tell me, what do you have 
in your house. In other words, he doesn't say, I'm here with all the answers. He respects her dignity and he says, let's start with what you have and let God meet the need through what you have. So she replies, your servant has nothing there at all. It's interesting that when you're hurting and when you're lacking, all that you can see is what you don't have and you miss all the blessings that you do have, right? This is going to speak to someone because when we get down and we're depressed and we're hurting and we're just consumed with what we don't have, I don't have enough money so I can, I can never be happy. I don't have a spouse so I can't really have a meaningful life just now. I don't have what I want so life doesn't matter. You know, I know ladies, not one personally, but I know some ladies that can walk into a closet full of clothes and they can touch every one of them. And what do they say? I have nothing to wear. You could feel, you could clothe an African village with what they have, and yet all they can see is what they don't have. It's funny how when you're in need, all you focus on is what you don't have. And this is exactly where this poor woman was. She lost everything, and all she could see was her lack. And so I asked this question, what do you do when you don't have much? If you're taking notes, write this down. God is going to speak to someone here and tell you to stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you have. 2 King chapter 4, verse 2, she says this. He, he says, what do you have in your house? And she says, your servant has nothing at all except a small jar of olive oil. I don't have anything there at all. Oh, yeah, except this one little thing. Stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you've got. You may say, well, what good is a small jar of olive oil? Olive oil was actually incredibly valuable because it was very rare and had tons of important uses. Oil was used in cooking, which is a good thing. Oil was used in lamps to help them burn, which is a good thing. It was used to moisturize because you couldn't go to Bath and Body Works and get something that squirts on your face. It was used to help keep leather pliable. It was used for, to keep iron from rusting. It was used as an offering to God. It was used to help anoint people in religious serv services. It was very valuable, but she didn't have a lot. She only had a little. I'm so thankful that we serve a God who specializes in doing a lot with a little. And this is going to speak to someone because we're serving a God who is absolutely capable of doing a lot with a little. Let me remind you of just a few of these stories all through Scripture. We see it again and again back in the New Testament when Jesus taught thousands of people and at the end of the lesson everyone was hungry and the disciples say well who's going to feed all these people and everyone goes I don't have any food and this little boy comes up and he says I don't have a lot but I've got a little I get excited when I hear this and see this brought to God I don't have a lot but I've got a little and here it is Lord and he took what he had and he said all I have is five loaves and two fishes. And in the hands of the Son of God, a little bit becomes a lot and feeds the thousands and even had 12 basketfuls left over because we serve a God who can do a lot with a little. In the Old Testament, when the army was afraid of the Philistines because of one man, Goliath, who stood them down, guess who he used? Guess who God used? A little shepherd boy with a little bit of faith and a little bitty stone who said, who are you to come against the armies of my living God? Everyone thinks you're too big to beat. I think you're too big to miss. Somebody duck because I'm taking this guy down. And God uses this little boy with a little faith and a little stone to take a big giant down. 
and in the New Testament scripture is really clear. Jesus says if you just have a little bit of faith, not a lot. Some of you say, I'm low on faith and all I have is a little. We serve a God who can do a lot with a little. If you just have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to a mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and you will see what you ask for done. If you just have a little bit of faith, we serve a God who can do a lot with a little. And Elisha says, what do you have in your house? What do you have in, what's in your house? Notice Elisha never said, what do you want? Or what do you need? But what do you have? Let's stop waiting for what we want and start working with what we have because God has given you everything you need to do everything he needs you to do. So many people say, we can't because we don't. And I believe a person with faith can say, we can because we don't. Because the limitations are often inside that gives us innovation. If we had what we needed, God wouldn't have been able to show us what, he, what we needed to see. I don't know how this will speak to you, but some of you, you're going to look at what you have and say, I wish I had something else so I could do something more significant. And God's going to say, no, 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 no. You stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you have. But you know, I'm not a good upfront person. I'm not charismatic. I'm good behind the scenes. And Jesus said it's the behind the scenes people that are the most important. Jesus said the servant is the greatest of all. So stop waiting, wanting something else and do the important assignment God has given you. There may be a guy in here who says, man, I'm not good enough provider. I don't make six-figure income. I wish I did. And God would say to you, hey, you're home six nights a week with your children. That's important. Stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you have. Parents, the most important thing that you do may not be what you do, but who you raise. When you're a person of God to your children, that's a huge success. Stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you have. The second thought that we learn from this awesome story is that we're going to offer God what you have and trust him to give you what you need. Watch this come true in 2 Kings verse chapter 4. Beginning with verse 3, Elisha said, go around, uh, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. You know, the first week we asked for plows, the second week we dug some ditches, and, and now we're asking for jars. Don't ask for just a few, then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars. And, and as each is filled, put, it, put one to the side. All you have is a little bit of oil. But if, you, if you'll trust God to pour out what you have, then put that jar aside. God will refill your jar and give you what you need. And you can keep on pouring. Dave and I, we both like magic tricks. I'm sorry, my thing is a little off. There it goes. Dave and I, we both like magic tricks. Sometimes they work, and for Dave, some, most times they don't. <laughs> the reason that magic does not always work is because magic tricks are just that. They're tricks. But the only thing was God was not doing a trick. God was giving a blessing. This was a ridiculous request by a God who was going to provide. 
When she had the faith to offer what she had, God would give her what she needed. And that's exactly what happens in verse 5. She left him and shut the door behind him, behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her, her sons, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then, and only then, did the oil stop pouring. As long as there's an empty jar, God would fill it. But when there was no more jars, the oil was going to stop. Verse 7, she went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what was left. When she offered what she had, God gave her everything that she needed. As long as there was an empty jar, the oil kept flowing. This was a ridiculous request to ask her to empty out everything that she had and trust God to provide what she really needed. But this is how our God works. When we show him our faith, we get to see his faithfulness. And this story has more personal implications for me and for our church than we could ever describe because in, in 2016 we made an, this exact kind of ridiculous faith decision that honestly changed the course of our church. You see, we didn't have the space that we needed. We had dreamed of growing our children and our youth programs, but we didn't have a place to serve them. But we did have a kindergarten program that served no one in our church, no one in our community, and didn't bring in enough revenue to even support itself. On top of that, New laws were being made where we were going to have to spend an additional half million dollars just to upgrade our facilities. But here was all this space that was being taken up by the program, and we made the decision that at first was hard to accept. But when looking back at the decision, it was a God blessing. We emptied the room, and, and God filled it with children and youth that are seeking to know him today. And it took more faith because it's hard to stop a program everyone loved. And I don't know how it would speak to you, but at some point when you take what you have and you stop waiting for what you want, but you offer what you have, God will do something special. And he says, go get a bunch of jars. Notice he didn't say what color. He didn't say what size. He didn't say what shape. He didn't say how expensive. What did he say? The only requirement is that the jars must be empty. It could have been any kind of jar. It could have been a milk jug. It could have been a peanut butter jar. It could have been a butter tub because God can use any shape, size, and color. He just needed it to be empty. How does this apply to you? 2 Corinthians 4.7 and the New Testament says this, it says, But we have this treasure, which is Christ, in jars of clay. What, what is that referring to? Do you know what that is? The jars of clay, that, that's our bodies. That's what we are. We're, we're clay pots. We're dirt houses. That's what we are. We have this treasure in these jars of clay. So what is God looking for? God is looking for a few empty jars. When we empty ourselves of self, when we empty ourselves of pride, when we empty ourselves of greed, when we empty ourselves of our own agenda and come to God totally empty, then he can fill us with the oil which has always been the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And suddenly you realize when you don't have what outwardly you wanted, it is God that you truly needed. And suddenly he is enough. He is sufficient in every single way. You see, when you are weak, he's your strength. 
When you're hurting, he's your comforter. When you're lost, he's your guide. When you're hungry, he's the bread of life which nurtures you. When you're thirsty, he's a living water. When your life is unstable, he's the rock that does not move. When you realize, I don't have what I wanted, then suddenly you discover that he is what you exactly needed. And some of you came today and you're empty and you're lacking and you're, you're going to look at him and he's going to become everything that you need. Stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you have. Offer God what you have and trust God to give you what you need. I want to just pay careful attention right now because the imagery of this story, it matters to every single one of us. I want you to think about that widow. Her story, it's your story. It's my story. She had a debt that was impossible for her to repay. All of us have a debt that we simply cannot pay. It's called sin. All of us, we sinned against the holy God, and we don't have the spiritual equity to make it right. That's why the gospel is what every person needs to experience. The gospel means good news. Some would say it's too good to be true, and, and I tell you, it's too good not to be true. That our good God, in his love and mercy, while we were still sinners, sent Jesus, the sinless Son of God, who was born of a virgin and lived a perfect life, gave his life on a cross because sin and, and became sin for us. He died and rose again, and on the third day, so anyone who calls on the name would be saved. Anyone, including every single one of you. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, and how bad you've been. What do you do today? You just empty your life. Just give it over to him and say, I give you my hurts. I give you my failures. I confess my sin. I empty myself of me. And let him fill you with him. And when you call on him, he will hear your prayer. He will make you new. He will forgive every sin that you've ever committed. You'll be filled with his spirit and your life will never be the same again. When you realize, I don't have what I wanted, then suddenly you'll discover he is exactly what you needed. Let's pray. Father, speak to us today. Pour out your spirit. Build our faith. We pray that we would be different in your presence. As we continue to pray today, those of you that are hurting, those of you that are without, those of you that are on empty, those of you that are overwhelmed, I believe that God wants to reveal himself to you in a deeper and more intimate way than maybe you've ever known him before. Those of you who would say, I need a prayer, I've got a burden, I've got a challenge, I'm hurting, I'm empty, I would just ask that you lift your hands today. God, I pray for each person, indicating they need even more of you, God. I thank you that you know the intimate details of every person's life. God, I thank, that you, I thank you that you are good, that you are here. And God, that when we look at you, you may not give us what we want. But God, you always provide what we need. I pray, God, that in this moment that your Holy Spirit would fill these empty <coughs> vessels, that your presence would be exactly what we need, that you would give us a supernatural peace that goes beyond our human ability to understand, that you would be our divine comforter, that you would be our strength, that, God, you would be the lifter of our heads, that you would be our provider. God, I pray that you would build our faith to offer you what we have and to trust you to give us what we need. Build our faith, God, as we give first to you. As we show you our faith, we get to experience your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand for our benediction? 
And now, as you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, go and pour out your jars to those around you. Amen. Turn it into highways, you're the only 